right? So this is going to be our last study in this um, sort of focus area because obviously we're going to cover the, the Gospel of John today and then we'll have to move on to something else because we've run out of Gospels. Um, but what we want to do is obviously bring our considerations of these four Gospels and this message of reconciliation to a, a close, as it were, and round it off with this last Gospel, the Gospel of John. Um, and again, we, we're not going to do it any justice, really, because there's just so much um, in each of these Gospels. But what we want to do is just, as we've been trying, hit the wrong button here. Um, we want to be able to look at how John's gospel says what it says. And again, we're coming back to, well, the events that he chooses to include. And, and when you think of John's gospel, we tend to think of all of the, the unusual events that he includes. And we'll, we'll put up a, a chart a little later of, of those events. But he also has, obviously, things that he excludes, which are equally important. The settings that he places things in, we've got the words that he chooses to focus in on, all of which push us in a particular direction to understand what this face is that we're looking at. When we stare into John's gospel, what do we see as far as the face of our Lord Jesus Christ and the glory that that reveals about the character of, of God that we have come to love and to serve? So, um, that's our intention. Now, if we were going to try to find a verse of John, and certainly pretty much anybody's familiar with the Bible has honed in on this verse. And to me, it's just as good as any verse in John to try to encapsulate what is meant by John, a gospel of kinship. In other words, a gospel about family. And here we have John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's the point of this gospel. And, and you could argue that's the point of the entire Bible, that the message that is contained throughout the scripture is how much God has loved what he's created and the lengths into which he will go to bring about that family, even to the offering of his only son. And, and it taps into these themes of father and son and eternal life and everlasting life. And we're going to explore those in, in, in at least in some way as, as we move forward this afternoon. So um, authorship. Now, I didn't talk about the authorship of, of Luke's gospel. And, and, and I think you know, if we, we continue down the line where we're going to do some more of these, we might spend some time in Luke's gospel. So, um, but let's just talk about John's gospel. Can you come over to the end, go to the end of the gospel of John and look at this last chapter and see what it tells us about this author? Um, and again, given the amount of time that we've got, we're not going to do an exposition of the life of John. We just wanted to see how this author is the right person for the job. So what we know is that in, in John chapter 21, and if you come down to, to verse um, 20 and 20 through 22, it says that then Peter turned about and he seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved leaning on his breast at supper. So the one who was leaning on him at, at dinner time, which had asked, who would betray thee? Peter, seeing him, he says to him, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus says, well, if he tarry till I come, what is that to you? Follow me. Now, the reference that we've got there at the bottom of the screen is where he was leaning upon him in John 13. So you don't really need to turn to John 13 and verse um, 23, but it's being alluded to that this is that, that person. Now, the other reference here in John 21 that's worth noting is just come down to verse 24. So John 21, 24, it says that this is the disciple which testified these things and wrote these things 
and know that his testimony is true. Now, there's plenty of people who have, who have suggested a whole range of individuals who could be the author of the Gospel of John. I'm going to suggest to you that it's John. And we can discuss that and debate that later if people wish. But John, according to this verse, 24, says the one who wrote this gospel record, whose record is true, is the one who is leaning on Jesus, the one that Jesus loved. Now, if we just take that as a summation of, of why this author, there was obviously a very close relationship between John and our Lord Jesus Christ. And their relationship was one where it was recognized how special he was, that he was loved. Now, we just read that God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. And it's no doubt that that, that love was demonstrated in the son, and he would have loved all of the disciples. But there was something about John. And I think it's the location, the position that we find John and that is referred to in, in, two, in these two places about him is that in the chapter in front of us in 21, it says that he leaned upon his breast. So he was on his chest here at dinner. When you look at the John 13 account, it says that he was leaning on Jesus' bosom. Now, I was hoping that you would be able to say, oh, bosom? I've heard that before. I've heard that. that that's interesting. I've, I've, I've heard that. And when you think of what we talked about on our last occasion in Luke's gospel, what we discovered was that Lazarus found himself in Abraham's bosom. And it's the same word. So this word bosom here in John 13 is the same word in Luke 16. We're talking about the Abraham's bosom. And so Lazarus found himself in Abraham's bosom. And what we, we discovered when we compared that with uh, Genesis and, and Eliezer and Abraham was it was a question about who actually is the, the heir. So Abram back in Genesis was saying, well, I, I've got no, no heir. I have no son. I have no, no one to leave all this to except for this Eliezer, this Lazarus, a Gentile. And God says, no, the one who comes out of your bosom, your bowels, will be your heir. And it's interesting that that, that word bosom, as is, is it's used in the New Testament, is, is the idea of, you know, their, their garments were sort of folded over and they didn't have pockets like we do. And so their garment, the folds of their garment in front of their chest acted as their pocket. And so when you look at Strong's, he talks about this idea of it, it, the fold of a pocket. Um, Easton's Bible Dictionary talks about this idea of being carried in the bosom was because it was where people carried things. They actually, like, you know, probably where we see it in, in um, Western society would be if you went – fruit picking if you've ever gone to and and gone out to your tree to pick fruit and all of a sudden you get out there and you go and you put one down and you think oh there's a whole bunch of fruit here you know or the fijoas that are falling on the ground and you you pick them up and you realize i haven't brought a bucket and so what do we all do we we, we grab our shirt and we make a bucket out of it a pocket and we carry that fruit in this pouch like a kangaroo that's the idea of this word in the Greek. It also refers to like a, a bay, you know, where the sea is enfolded in the land, like in a pocket. So when we say that, that we're talking about John and his authorship, he chose to be in the pocket, in the bosom of Jesus. And if we compare that with our Acts 16, so if we put those two passages together in our understanding of, of, of Luke 16, what we discover is the relationship between Lazarus and Abraham is the same relationship 
between John and Jesus in the sense that they both find themselves in the bosom of that person. And that's a strong connection. Now, if we want to make that stronger still, can you go over to John chapter 1 and verse 18? You see that little reference at the bottom of the screen. See also John 1 verse 18. And if you come over to John 1 18, look at how John uses this about a different relationship. And it's interesting that he, he he plays with this idea throughout his gospel. It's like one of those, this lovely little thread. In John 1, 18, it says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, hath declared him. And again, it's the same word. So the Son, the only begotten Son, is in the bosom of God. And when you think about that, that is where a, a, a mother carries their child. So that this is hearkening back to the womb and how connected they are. And when you think of connected, not only are they connected in the sense that one sits in the, inside the other, but they're actually connected with a cord that feeds and nourishes that growing child. This is how strong the relationship is. It's saying that Jesus, in his relationship with his father, was connected by this, this like a cord. He was wrapped up in, in, in the father's bosom. And then John, he wants to be in that. You know, he, it almost is like, you know, if you want to think of a comical cartoon where you've got the, the, the big mummy kangaroo and then in her pouch is, is, is a kangaroo. And in that little kangaroo's pouch is another pouch another little kangaroo in a pouch and so on like you know the the, the little um, russian dolls that sit one inside the other and so john sits inside his lord and his lord sits inside his god and again we see that in the gospel played out in this gospel john will say that they may be one as we are one that, that they may be in us as we are in each other that they might abide, you know, just if you just think about that concept and then think about the passages that you know so well in the Gospel of John, whether it's the vine and that you cannot abide alone, but you must be in me, or whether you think about John 17 and his prayer, in each location in John, he comes back to this idea of the bosom. And rightly so, somebody who is in that place ought to write this gospel. I, I hope that makes a bit of sense as to the, the power and the weight of this particular choice. And it's, and it's obviously deliberate. And, and as we're coming to the end of, of our studies together, I appreciate that a lot of this has been fairly academic and it's very sort of more clinical. But take the time to go and look at how Paul talks about this idea of, of workmanship and authorship when it applies to us. For ye are his building, ye are his husbandry. The good work that he hath begun in you, in each one of you, he will perform it. In other words, God is working in us to bring about his gospel message. We are, as has been often said, a walking, talking, living Bible. And isn't that where John's gospel begins with us? And the word was made flesh and it dwelt among us. And we beheld, we beheld it. So when we get to John's gospel, if you were to take it in some kind of like, you know, order, we've come right into the house, right into that pouch right into that pocket, that bosom, that relationship. And now what we're seeing is, is what that really means for a believer. And so I, I hope that you guys can take the excitation out of it as opposed to, you know, like I'm just trying to give some structure. And the excitation, I hope, just falls out naturally. Um, so we've talked uh, uh, very briefly about these, these word themes. Um, in our very first talk, but coming back to them, God's title as Father is just 
astronomical in the in, in its use in the Gospel of John. I mean, you've just got a sample on the screen there. It's just so prevalent. I, I'd have to almost make a whole slide just for that title. And so God's relationship with His Son is is described in that way, and in, in nowhere else in Scripture is 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 emphasized in John's Gospel. John, uh, his choice of of the title for Jesus is the Son of God. Now we said that in Mark he was he was Jesus of Nazareth. Here in John's Gospel, he uses lots of titles for Jesus. I'm not saying that he only uses the Son of God, but the dominance, the dominance of that title, is so important to what John is trying to demonstrate for us. Um, again, eternal life and, and the use of eternal life or everlasting life in John's Gospels leaves the others for, for, for dead, pun intended. That in John's Gospel, you will get more about life and eternal life than you do in all four, the other four, three Gospels combined. That word life and it more abundantly is abundant in John's Gospel. Um, we mentioned this, and if you, you take the time and it, you're curious about it, is that instead of on, on um, mountains in Matthew or on ships in Mark or in houses in Luke, his setting is always with the feasts. It'll be that the feast of this was, that was nigh at hand or it was so many days after the feast. In fact, he, he introduced a feast that you know, we don't even know about outside of, of John's gospel. And so the, 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 the need to place Jesus against a feast runs through. And of course, his locations are probably not as, as, as far flung. In other words, again, John keeps Jesus by and large in Jerusalem. And his time has got huge gaps because he's trying to keep Jesus in the house, in the place where God has chosen to place his name. So again, John's gospel is deliberate in all the things that are left out of it to put us in a place um, where we're in proximity with our father um, and his. In the last thing on the slide and what we'll spend um, probably you know the latter half of, of, of this talk talking about is these I am's and this unique phraseology that that John chooses to use to describe the Lord Jesus Christ so he's not he's not talking about the kingdom of heaven he's not talking as much in in word pictures he's going to talk about what is and I think that's really important to our understanding so again I'm, I have no intention of pulling apart all of the I am's and John because that's usually a series in itself I hope you, all I want to do is try to show you the structure and why those and why the way they are placed in the gospel okay so I'll just give you a minute to cast your eye across that because I appreciate that it, when we talk about John's gospel, we're talking about a lot of u unique um, events. And so unlike any other gospel, um, he, he, is, he is weird in what he chooses to include. Not weird in a bad way, but in a very deliberate way, he makes this choice to have um, these particular gospels um, presented to us, and we have uh, pr these particular events presented to us in his gospel. So he's very light on in 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 the things that um, Matthew and uh, Luke choose to record. And I, and I guess I acknowledge that the scripture says those who compare themselves amongst themselves are not wise. And so you could argue comparing the gospels is not terribly wise. But if you just think about the, you know, now that we've come to the fourth one and you think of all that we've said before, Matthew and Luke have a commonality in some respects, and yet they're vastly different. And we say Matthew and Mark have commonalities in some respects and yet are quite different. When you look at John, he shares a lot in common with Luke. 
in his structure and his tones. But again, he doesn't have as much to say in certain spots. So for example, Matthew and Luke go so far to, you know, go back to the childhood and the birth, and even Luke before the birth, where John, one could argue, goes all the way back to the beginning, or he, like um, Mark, takes a, a point of, of looking at the beginning of the ministry. And, and so Mark and John share that common starting point where um, Matthew and Luke share a common starting point of going back, you know, as it were, 30, 30 years sort of earlier. So when you look at those, and I appreciate you can't just, you know, take in a whole gospel of unique events in, in one sitting. So um, please, please don't. I think I'm trying to suggest that, but just cast your eyes across that and, and take a moment to, to look at the unusualness that is there. Okay. Now, this is a, um, a photocopy of um, of John Carter's Parables of the Messiah book. And so this, uh, this is a list from our brother Carter of all the parables um, as they are recorded in the gospel accounts. And you can see which ones overlap um, with which. And it was a tremendous resource, obviously, in, in putting together these kind of unique events and studies and, and looking at overlaps and things like that. But do you notice that there's something missing? And it's not an oversight from our brother Carter. There is a noticeable difference, and, and one would probably not pick it out if it wasn't for the context of our talk today. And that there is there, there's no column for the Gospel of John. So when you look at it, it says Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then you, know, you sit there and think, oh, has it been lost in the fold of the page or fallen off the edge of the other side? And the answer is no, because there are no Gospels recorded, oh, sorry, no Gospels, I keep doing that to you guys. There are no parables recorded in the Gospel of John. And what we have to ask ourselves is, why? That is so bizarre. Because if we were like Luke to sit down and say, well, we have, we've gained a certain level of knowledge and understanding, and we wanted to share a Gospel message, about Jesus and write down all the things that we thought people needed to know, parables would certainly fall on our list. And yet John does not. And you think, well, that's got to be a deliberate choice. Now, can you come over um, with me um, to um, where John does mention the word parable, as in the, the, the record actually uses the word parable in its translation? Okay, so if you could turn to John chapter 10, and you'll find that there is the word parable in the English or in the authorized version, but what you'll notice is that from the screen in front of you, it's not the same word for parable that you get elsewhere. So in, in John chapter 10, and verse 6, it says, this spake Jesus unto them. So I'm reading it off the bottom of the screen there. This he spake unto them, and, um, but they understood not what he said. He spake this parable unto them, but they didn't understand what he spake. Now that seems very similar to the, the, the sentiments that are presented to us in the Matthew account that you see there, where it talks about in Matthew 13, 13, that he spake these I things in the Not sure what I did there. Um, in in Matthew thirteen thirteen, it says he he was asked the question, "Why do you speak in parables?" And he says, "Well, I speak in parables so that because seeing they will see not, and hearing they will hear not, neither will they understand." John ten seems to give a similar statement on the surface, but they understood not that this was a parable you know, or the meaning of this parable. When you look at it, this is a different word. 
So the first word, which we commonly understand the word parable to mean, is something that is placed alongside of something else. So it's a comparison. So the, uh, the word parable is saying, I'm going to place this object, as it were, next to it. That's what it means literally in the Greek. Okay. We would use the word simile in English. We would say that something is like something else. So he was um, as strong as a lion. His strength was like a lion. So like and as are the marks of a simile. So if you want to understand, you know, I realize this is like an English grammar lesson, you know, um, kind of thing. Um, if you want to understand the word parable in an English terminology, think simile. When we look at John's work, use of this word, this other Greek word, parable, it means a proverb, a dark saying with shadow, which set, shadows forth some didactic truth. Now, that, that's Thayer's explanation. Essentially, in our language, it's more like a metaphor. So the other gospel records, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, speak in similes. The kingdom of heaven is like. For it is like a sower who went out to sow. The, where John talks about what is. So he doesn't say Jesus is like a sower. He says Jesus is the bread of life. Now, we, in English, we don't see them as being vastly different things. It's a, it's a, a figurative tool used to convey, you know, a, a, a message or to embolden a statement. But to the Greek, it is a very different thing. One is something that is placed aside as opposed to what is. And so Jesus is these things as opposed to what he's like. Now, I, what I hope to do with the time that, you know, the, the, the next half hour is to look at how that plays out and the importance of it. So um, can you come over to Exodus chapter three, where we get an example of this um, concept of I am? So in Exodus chapter three, you, you'll recall that this is when uh, Moses um, finds himself um, at the burning bush and he's he's um, he's told to take his, his shoes off and then he, he's commissioned with this this work of of um, going and and freeing the people bringing them out of Egypt and Moses asked the question well who should I say has sent um, sent you. So they're going to ask this question, like, essentially, wh what right do you have to say this? And who gave you that right? And so he says, what's your name? And God says, tell them that I am that I am hath spoken unto you. And so here we get the, the, the name of God, I am. Now, in our community, we've spent a lot of time and energy talking about the not so much an I am, but a will be. And a lot of that comes out of um, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible and its foreword, so its introduction to it, where it talks about why not to use Jehovah versus Yahweh. And from that has come a real focus on this idea of I will be. I will be is a future thing. I am is a current thing, current state of being. So what God tells Moses is I am. Now, if you are an I am, that means that you are always. So when we think of the same yesterday, today, and forever, that sequence of events, when God says to Moses, I am, the implications of that is, if you say, I am hungry, 
and now two seconds later you say I am, you still are. In other words, there is no time constraint because it is a state of being. It's the state of existence. I don't know if I've clarified that or made it more confusing to you. The idea of an I am is eternal. And so we often talk about he who will be as if God is only ever a future event in the way we unpack the word, where he is now. And I think, you know, if you wanted a strong excitation about the, the name of God and, and an I am, we will never be a will be if we are not an I am now. I'll say that again a little bit slower. We will never be a will be if we are not an I am now. If we are not bearing the name of God now, and he is not seen to exist in us now, then how can we ever hope to become something, to will be he who will be manifested in a multitude? He's someone to be manifested now. And that is what John's gospel declares to us in these I am's. It is the existence of the character and, and attributes and the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And the word of God, and this, is, this probably helps us to understand why John is so, what we would see as uh, mystical or unusual or creatively introducing his gospel. When he says, the, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, and then that word becomes flesh, you can see that it, it, it becomes into existence in an individual. When Jesus is, arrives on the scene, the character of God is there. It's what we would understand when we say Emmanuel, God with us, God existing presently. I hope that makes sense. I'm, 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 you know, you say it a few times in your head and you think, oh, I'm probably making things harder than they are. But I think it's really important for us to understand where this I am statement comes from and what is meant by it when we, when we look at the examples given to us um, moving forward. So this is the list of I am's. And this is the order in which they occur. <laughs> so the first I am is I am the bread of life. And it's recorded there for us in John um, 6, verse 48. So if you'd just like to come over to John, come back to John, and we'll go to John 6. And again, I, I don't intend to, um, to unpack, as it were, you know, a, a chapter with 60-odd verses in it, which is all speaking about this I am. It's probably just worth writing or underlining or highlighting in your Bible, or whatever you do, um, this I am statement. So I am the bread of life. Okay. If we then were to scroll, or I'm scrolling, you're probably turning, turn over to John chapter 8. Now, if you haven't marked these, it's very worth marking. The next one is John 8 and verse 12, and it says, I am the light of the world. But he that follow, um, but he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Okay? Come down to John chapter 10. John 10, and we stop at verse 9, John 10. He says, I am the door. Now, if you left it at that one verse, John 9, you'd go, well, I don't see, you've put life next to it. I don't see life there. But if you read into the next verse, it says, I come, I am come that they may have life. So again, you have an I am statement connected to life. And what we start to see is already that the bread of life, the light of the world, the door of the sheepfold, these are all statements that have life connected to them. So there's a commonality of all these I am's. They're all about life, which we said is a major theme in, in Luke's gospel. You don't have to go very far to get to the next one. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep, and I am known of mine. Verse 15, as the Father knoweth me, so 
Even so, know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So again, we've got this connection between the I am statement and life, which is what I guess I was trying to say so poorly on our previous slide, which is when we talk about I am, that I am, that I am has sent you, it's a statement of life. Because when you say I am, you are saying you exist. That's what that means, I exist. And so these statements that we are going through very rapidly, I appreciate, are all statements about life. And oddly enough, in this particular section that we've just paused on in John chapter 10, he talks about his, the power he has to lay down his life and the power to take it up again. You can see that in, in verse um, 17, because I lay down my life, then I may take it up again. Verse 18, um, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up. This commandment have I received of my father. That, that this statement is about a life that is offered, a willing offering. And when you think of the power, the power is given in that choice. We have a choice to surrender our will, our life to, to the Father. And that's a choice that we made or are making. It's the choice that was and is now and is to come in every moment of our lives. What choice will we make? And so, you know, if we continue on, sorry, I, you, know, you get, I tell you I'm not going to get stuck on something and then all of a sudden you find yourself getting revved up. Coming down to, to Luke chapter 11 and verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. Well, I mean, you can't really talk about being the resurrection without necessarily having life connected to it, but it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. And there's that power of this statement, the power of life, life out of death. Um, I'm just conscious of the time, so I'm trying to keep us moving here. Come down to, to Luke, uh, sorry, Luke. Got to stay on the right gospel. John chapter 14. So in John chapter 14, we come down to verse 6. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And again, I, I hope, even though we're whistling across all of these things, Think about that, that authorship that we talked about and how, you know, one is in, in the bosom of the other, who's in the bosom of the other. You can see that each of these I am's pick up that idea and they run with it in a, in a slightly different way. You can't come to the Father but by me. That this is the way, you know, it's through this, the access of this bosom that one has access to the Father, because that's how the Son accesses, accesses the Father. And so here we have a way that is open to us, that is again about life. And the last I am, I am, is in, in um, John 15. Um, it's stated in verse 1 and then repeated in verse 5. I am the true vine. So not just a vine, I'm the true vine, and my father is the husband. And then come down to verse 5, I'm the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. And we, we, If you cast your eye across those verses in between, you, you go, well, I don't see the word life. And you could say it's implied by the connection that you can't bring forth fruit. If you're dead. But we also know that if we cast our eye down on the chapter, just a few more verses, it says um, that no, uh, verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And this is all bound up in, in the vine. 
So what we can see clearly in all of the IMs, and there's seven of them, I suggest there's seven, some people speculate there's eight. Um, eight is a good speculation. Seven is a perfect number. Eight is actually the number of resurrection, which is the, the extension of life. So um, I'm sure there'll be somebody arguing that there's an eighth I am um, in um, John, and I'm not, I'm not going to dispute um, with you about that. Can anyone see, you know, because we're, we're supposed to be talking about the structure, you know, I'm digressing here, but, it, it, you know, we talk about the structure of John. And so I'm just taking you through it very rapidly. Chapter six is the first one. Chapter 15 is the, the last one on our list of seven there. But what do you notice about the start and the finish? I'm not expecting you to, to break your code of silence here. Isn't it interesting? Yeah, bread and wine. Isn't it interesting that 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 when John structures his gospel and he 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 says, you know what, I'm I'm not going to talk about parables. We, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they can do that, and they've done that, you know, an admirable job with that. I'm going to talk about what Jesus is. I'm going to talk about the I am's, and he starts with the bread of life, and he ends with the true vine. And that can't be just coincidence. That's not by haphazardness. That is a very deliberate act, a very deliberate act of structure to bring us through this process. And isn't it interesting that if you say the bread of life, and we just, we, you know, we talk about what we know about bread and wine and the symbols that say Paul further explains to us, bread is a statement about a fellowship you are one loaf so there's a connection there there's that bosom idea contained in the bread of but it's broken that this represents the body that's broken so it's dead it's 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 bruised it's you know i know that jesus was not broken there wasn't a bone of him broken but in in spirit he was broken and that's the starting point. If we want to travel through this journey of life, you know, in the I am statements, there's the process outlaid for us that it starts with a broken spirit seen in the bread of life, broken that it might live. And we have fellowship one with another in that. And then we have to see and walk in the light. We have to enter in through the door and not be like a thief and a robber and try our own way. You know, there's no other avenue to dive into these things. We've got to follow the good shepherd who leads us in green pastures that we might come from the valley of the shadow of death. So think of the front half of the, the three. I don't know if you can have a halfway point, but the good shepherd sits, the, he's the middle point. He's the pivot point. So the first half of those I am's, if you want to say a structural, is the process of going from the valley of the shadow of death into the green pastures of life. And the good shepherd is that pivotal point where we're then resurrected and we, we come and we find a table prepared where our cup runneth over and we drink of the, the, the life. And again, you know, it's the poured out blood. It's a poured out life. Again, it begins and ends with a sacrifice. So there's, I mean, I hope you can see that just on a structural level, it's like, whoa, there's so much there. And we're just, we're just flying through it. We're just, we're just ripping across it. Now, Another layer of complexity to just show you how powerful this this structure is. If that wasn't enough, if we wanted to just say, "Oh wow," when we we pick up John's gospel and move forward into the 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 work of the apostle Paul and others, we see so much in this structure. What if we went the other way? What if we went into the Old Testament, went backwards? And I, and I think our, our brother Ron has already given some indications in some of his studies of how much John's gospel has these elements in it. And I, I think he's probably sort of 
going, oh, what's he going to do here? And, and I hope I agree with our brother, Ron. I hope I'm not su suggesting things that, that um, uh, undermine the, the, the work that he's presented. Um, but there's no, there hasn't been any, like, you know, we haven't gotten, there's no conspiracy here. Just take a, a moment to think. Where have we seen elsewhere in scripture bread and light and doors? And now the shepherd issue is probably a more cryptic one, but this idea of resurrection and a way and a, and a vine and, 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 and those symbols, what they stand for. We said that John's gospel was about the house and in particular family, the people who make up the inside of the house and all with the intention of bringing us to the most holy place where Luke are, are the friends who become part of our house. John is in the house. Matthew is on the outside of the house. He's, he's out here in the court of the Jews. And then Mark is outside further in the court of the Gentiles. But when we come into this place and we just think about even these things, the altar of burnt offerings and the labor where the priests washed. Can you go to John chapter one? And I, 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 I'm again conscious that in 10 minutes, I'm going to try to unpack all of the signs of John and the structure outlaid. In a, in a in 10 minutes so we're going to redo it all looking at it through this um type and shadow that that went before if you're in john 1 come down to verse 29 now in john 1 29 it says the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. John's gospel begins in essence where? On this diagram, we could suggest from that statement and the ones that preceded it at this altar of burnt offerings, the Lamb that taketh away the sins of the world was offered here. It's not offered in here. Well, I mean, I'm just going to pause because I can imagine Brother Leo is going to go, whoa, it actually is offered there. And I would say in type, yes. I mean, under the law, you know, it's here at the altar of burnt offerings. Then you have Jesus' baptism hot on the heels of it. And if that, you know, you're kind of going, oh, here's this. Now, whenever we try to do this, you know, there's always somebody who wants to have a, a, a nice long bow and try to take some, you know, giant shot from a great distance. If, if this isn't then the, the labor with the priest washed and baptism, isn't it interesting that in John chapter 3, you have another discussion about this idea of, of being washed. And so in John chapter three, you have the story of Nicodemus coming to Jesus and asking the question, you know, how can one be born again? He came at night and he asked this question and Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus asked the question, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, we've already already discussed in some ways how John understood that, because John understood that to be born again and to enter back into that womb was to sit in the bosom of your Lord. And he's already referenced that relationship in John chapter 1 between Jesus um, and God, that Jesus was the son of God was in the bosom of the father. And so John would know how one could be born again because he finds himself in that same position. But what's interesting is that Jesus then says, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so we've got this reference to this idea of, well, what is the washing? Is it is it actually the washing of water? Or is it the washing of a 
of a spirit, of a conscience. Now, the reason I, the only reason I point that out, and, and you, you might say, well, that, that's, that's interesting, is that we still haven't gotten to the bread of life. The bread of life will be introduced to us in John chapter 6. And so if we were to say, isn't it interesting that there's a progression where the priest enters in through the gate here, he goes through the entrance gate, he would go past the altar of burnt offerings, he would wash in the laver, and then he would come to this door. Now you might say, oh, you know, this is the door. But isn't it interesting that John 6 talks about the bread of life that would have sat upon the showbread, the bread of the faces. And then what's our next I am? So we go from, from bread of life to light of the world. And so we've got these two images. And when um, they, they talk about the creation of these things, I'm pretty certain, and I'm sure someone will chase it down while I'm talking to see whether I'm right or wrong. But generally, in my research, the, the table of the showbread precedes the lampstand in its discussion. And so it does in John's. So John references this in 6 and references this idea in 8. And when you look in, say, Exodus 39, verse 35 through 40, you see that this is talked about first than this. And that seems to be consistent with, with how it's discussed as, a, as an object. Now, what I'd like to suggest to you is that when we talk about the door of the sheepfold, you could argue that it is this door. But I'm also happy for you to argue it that this door, there's two doors here. And assuming that we're progressing and we're moving this way, the next I am would then, it would stand to reason, the, the next door would be here. So when he talks about the door, it does beg the question, is that the veil that's being spoken of? And I'm happy for people to disagree with, with that. And one of the reasons I ask that question is then the next thing that's talked about is being the good shepherd. And when you think about what the shepherd does, the shepherd we mentioned leads us into green pastures. What's that next? And, it, and this again is, 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 you know, it depends on what you, you're thinking here. Come over to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter nine. Maybe this will clarify my thinking a bit for you. Why I think maybe the door is, is here. This is the door of the sheepfold versus this door. If you come over to Hebrews chapter 9, he says, Then verily the first covenant had the ordinances and design service of worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick, the table, uh, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So he says here that the sanctuary, or what we would call the holy place, composed the table of showbread and the lampstand. And then he makes this co co confusing statement, or possibly confusing statement, or some people have argued erroneous statement, where he says, and after the second veil, um, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it were the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now uh, speak particularly. And I feel like looking at the time that I too cannot speak particularly about these things. What I... What you pick up on that is Paul suggests that this actually sat here, inside the veil. Yet when you read the Old Testament record, it sat here before the veil. Now, people have, have made all kinds of comments and suggestions that, um, that it sat here, and then when the priest went in on the Day of Atonement, the veil, in a sense, was placed on the other side and put it in there. 
I tend to think because it was the altar of incense, it sat here physically, as in the physical altar here, but the incense, which was the important part, which represents the prayers of the saints, wafted into the most holy. And what Paul is talking about here is not so much where the physical object sat, but where this um, golden censer, because he doesn't talk about the altar so much. He talks about the, the censer or the, 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 the incense that flowed from it. And so maybe that's where this discrepancy lies. But if we're going to take John's gospel as an indication, it would suggest that it's John 6, John 8, John 10, verse 9. And then if this, if we take Hebrews account, this would sit like the good shepherd who leads the flock through the veil, through the door, which is his point in ch chapter 10. So if we just say John 10 sits here, then that leaves us with um, being the resurrection and the life and the vine. Now, those objects, and I appreciate we're out of time now, I would suggest the resurrection, the way, the truth, and the life, and the vine can be seen in these, this space here. And so we would have to then unpack what you've got there in Hebrews chapter 9, where he says, well, once you uh, have entered in, you are then uh, presented with the Ark of the Covenant, the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant with a mercy seat. And I, I would suggest to you that it's worth your, your time exploring those ideas if that kind of um, pattern suggests it. The only reason I present that to you is that maybe when looking at this diagram and how it's outlaid, and how it functioned might be the inspiration for the structure of John's gospel in the sense that John's gospel, regardless of how far you want to boil this down to its you know, last socket and board and bar, John's gospel brings us oh, to this spot here where God dwells, where we are to dwell with our God. And I think that's the whole objective of John's gospel is to bring us here. And I think that's best summarized in, in the words of John chapter 17, which I think we'll conclude with. So if you could come over to John chapter 17, I'll try to get there too. So John 17. Um, John 17 and if you can look at starting at verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them which also shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved You. God loves you. And thou hast loved Christ. And so, is that not a statement of where we want to find ourselves when our Lord returns? In Him. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you.